As we have seen in the last video, the Council Act of 1909, also known as Morley Minto Act, was specifically designed to divide Indians on communal basis. This act introduced the concept of separate electorate for Muslims, which resulted in the partition of India. Let me explain how. An electorate is an area represented by one elected member of any council. During election, few candidates contest and voters give vote to their candidate of choice. Whoever gets the majority of votes wins. First past the post. The beauty of this system is that it doesn't matter if you gave vote to the winner or not or even you didn't vote at all. She will represent your questions in the assembly. But what happens when you have separate electorate? In the same constituency, few candidates contest but along the religious line. And voters give votes to a candidate of their religion only. That means a Hindu or a Sikh or a Christian candidate doesn't represent the Muslim. And a Muslim candidate doesn't represent a Hindu or a Sikh or a Christian. It means that Islam is not only just a different religion, but their social, political and economic questions are different from others. In a way, this Morley Minto Act wants to imply that Hindus and Muslims are not just different religions, but two different nations. This act gave rise to the infamous two-nation theory. This guy Minto, I have told you. Anyway, there were some welcome moves too in this act. For example, by this act, the legislative councils at centre and provinces were increased in size. Before this act, there was a concept of official majorities in which majority of provincial members were appointed from civil service officials and only a minority of members were elected by Indians. But by this act, the official majorities were lifted. So now Indian members can form the majority in the provincial legislative bodies. This act established Indian dominance in the provincial legislative bodies. But remember, the Central Legislative Council was still dominated by British majority. Another thing, this act provided for the first time for Indians to be associated with the Executive Council of Viceroy. Satyendra Prasad Sinha became the first Indian member in the Viceroy's Executive Council. Here you can see that Indians are gaining their piece of share in the legislature and in the executive. But the evil of communal divide will have its inevitable consequences. And we will remember Minto for this separate communal electorate. Other two things were Indian majority in the provincial legislative councils and Indian member that Satyendra Prasad Sinha in the executive council of Viceroy. Moving on, the next act is the Government of India Act of 1919 also known as Montague Chelmsford Act. There were five key provisions of this act. You may find it difficult to remember. But don't worry, there is a trick. Here, the year of this act is 1919. You can divide it into two equal halves. And that is the theme. Everything in this act is divided into two equal halves. For example, the Imperial Legislative Council is made bicameral by this act. Why? Let's understand. It is interesting to note that in our parliament today, we have Rajya Sabha as the upper house to represent the Indian states because the state government is autonomous from the union government. So at the parliamentary level, we need to have a state representation. Same goes for 1919. Before this act, there was an act of 1909 in which the provincial legislative assembly was given the Indian majority. So after that act, we can say that Provincial Legislative Assembly now represents Indian interest and now it needed to be represented at the central level. That's why the bicameral Central Legislature in 1919. Second thing, at the level of Union Executive, there were to be at least three Indian members in the Viceroy's Executive Council. Another thing is the subjects. Subjects of administration were divided into two lists, central and provincial, much like the seventh schedule of the present day. Why? Same logic. The Act of 1909 made provincial legislative assembly dominated by Indians and the Central Legislative Council was still dominated by the Britishers. So in order to avoid conflicts, subjects were divided between central and provincial. And provincial subjects were further categorized into two lists, reserved and transferred. The subject 
of reserved list were under the control of governor and the subject of transferred list were handed over to the Indians. It shows that there was a diarchy at the provincial level. Let's sum up. By the Act of 1919, the Imperial Legislative Council was made bicameral, three Indian members in the Viceroy's Executive Council, subjects were categorized into central and provincial, and provincial subjects were further categorized into reserved and transferred, that is, diarchy at provincial level. And the last thing this act provided was that after 10 years, a commission would be formed to analyze the working of Indian government. This resulted in the Simon Commission of 1927. And when Simon arrived, he met with strong resistance all across the country. People protested with the black flags and with the slogan, Simon go back. Lord Birkenhead, the Secretary of State, had challenged Indians to make constitution acceptable to all parties. To answer this challenge, a conference of all parties was called. A committee was appointed under the chairmanship of Motilal Nehru to draft a constitution. The committee submitted its report known as Nehru Report of 1928. In response to Nehru Report, Jenna gave 14 points. Even after all that drama, the report was not accepted by the government. And on the recommendation of Simon Commission, the British government called a roundtable conference to discuss the constitutional reforms in India. After Three rounds of conference, no conclusion could emerge. But a white paper was issued in the 1933, which gave details of the new constitutional reforms in India. And this white paper became the basis of Government of India Act of 1935. You may have an idea that our present day constitution is inspired by many other constitutions, but the majority of its portion is taken from the Act of 1935. Let's discuss the Government of India Act of 1935. Before this Act, Indian judiciary wasn't integrated. But by this Act, a federal court was formed, much like the Supreme Court of the present day. And all other courts of India were made subordinate to it. It means that this Act created an integrated system of judiciary. Along with the federal court, this act provided for the public service commissions and reserve bank. That's how this act created some institutions fundamental to any nation. Another thing, this act removed diarchy from the state and brought it to the center. And provincial autonomy was established. So after this act, provincial elections were held in 1937. Indian National Congress got majority and formed government in many provinces. It was like the first Indian government with Indian leaders in power. But after 27 months in office, Congress ministries resigned as a protest against India's inclusion in the Second World War. In terms of scale and intensity, the Second World War was much different from its predecessors. And for Britain, it was an existential crisis. In July 1940, Hitler launched his largest air attack on British cities known as the Battle of Britain. Now Britain is in dire need of help. On the 8th August 1940, Viceroy Linlithgow announced a political package for India, known as the August Offer. All major Indian parties rejected the August Offer. It was a difficult time for British Raj. On one hand, it was facing the largest war humanity has ever seen. And on the other hand, it was facing increasing pressure to transfer powers to Indians. The pressure was mounting on British government to negotiate with Indian leadership and for that purpose, the cabinet mission reached India and on its recommendation, the Constituent Assembly of India was formed. And Clement Attlee, the British PM, announced his intention to transfer powers to Indians by June 1948. But according to Mountbatten plan, India could be freed on August of 1947. And for that purpose, the last act was passed. Independence of India Act gave freedom to India and Pakistan. According to this act, Viceroy became the Governor General of India. Another thing, this act abolished the position of Secretary of State and all his powers were given to the interim government. It means that from now onwards, it was mandatory for Governor General of India to follow the advice of Council of Ministers led by Jawaharlal Nehru. 
And the last thing we need to remember is that by this act, Imperial or Central Legislative Council was dissolved. So after this, Constituent Assembly of India functioned as our first parliament. And here we are. Congratulations. And remember, revision is the key. It is highly advisable to watch all four videos again and make decent notes. See you soon.